Okay, let's talk about cocoa beans. Chocolate is the defining flavor of a chocolate bar. All of our chocolate flavor comes from the cocoa bean, the cacao. And so if you're gonna make a really good chocolate bar, you've gotta start with really good cocoa beans. So let's, let's look at how we evaluate a sample of cocoa beans to see if it's right for what we wanna do with it, which in our case, we're gonna make a, a very fine dark chocolate. So I've got two samples of cocoa beans. This sample is from Venezuela, all right? It's from Rio Caribe, it's a Trinitario, very high quality cocoa. And the other sample is from Bahia, all right? Bahia is um, the cocoa growing region on the coast of Brazil. Now this sample comes right from the warehouse. So if I was buying beans, which I, I sometimes do for clients, um, I'd get a sample like this from the warehouse and I'd use this, and this sample represents a lot of cocoa in the warehouse, which is for sale. And I would use this sample to um, predict the quality of that lot of cocoa beans. Okay, and so the first thing when we receive a cocoa sample is we smell it, okay? Now we can't tell if the sample is good, if the cocoa is good by smelling it, but we can tell if it's bad. So what I do is I just reach in get a handful of the beans and smell, take a deep whiff. And what I'm looking for are off flavors. Now good cocoa, cocoa without off flavors, will have a slight vinegary odor. There may be some kind of a burlap note. All that's fine, that's normal. But defective, defective odors can contribute to an off or bad tasting chocolate. And the most common and probably the, the most difficult is smokiness, all right? Now, smoky beans come from, in many origins, it's, it's the rainy season corresponds with the harvest. So, so when they're harvesting cocoa, they're fermenting it and drying it, the weather's rainy and they can't really dry the beans very well in the sun. And so they'll use various types of dryers. Now the best dryer is the solar dryer, which is, you know, we've talked about it, that in the past, but that's drying it under a, a cover of polyethylene. But sometimes they'll use what's called a Samoa dryer. And what a Samoa dryer is, it's just a, it's just a bed that the cocoa sits on that bed and underneath is a heat exchanger and there's a gas or, or wood burning heat source which then blows hot air through a heat exchanger and dries the cocoa. Well, if that heat exchanger gets holes in it, some of the combustion products can come up and contaminate the cocoa, and you can smell that. Now, wood is the most noticeable, and so wood smoke, it smells like charcoal, smells like burning wood, you know, like a campfire. And so that's, that's really what I'm looking for. These beans don't have it. But if you have that smoky flavor, it's almost impossible to get rid of. You can't dilute it out. You can't, you can't do anything with it. So you don't buy that cocoa. The other um, off note that we're looking for is a fermentation defect. Now you don't see this too much in Central America, but in Brazil, the cocoa region in Brazil is, first of all, it's rainy during the harvest time. So you have problems with smoke but also it's very cool. And sometimes the temperature is too low that you can't get a good fermentation. It, the, the mass never comes up to the right temperature. And when that happens, some off notes can develop, which are very distinct. And the one flavor that's characteristic, which Brazil's reputation, they've been trying to live it down forever. And they, to the most part, they have succeeded is hamminess. And it tastes like a baked ham. All right, just, you know, very distinctive. It's a fermentation defect, and that too is almost impossible to get rid of. All right, now you can sometimes get by by using a small amount of that in the blend, but if you're gonna use it straight, just forget it. The other, the other defect is, as we said, there can be um, combustion um, other than smoke. There can be, um, the burning of petroleum, the burning of gas, that type of combustion aroma can get into the cocoa as well. And that can be from a faulty heat exchanger on a dryer, or it also can be on the patio and they may have a truck idling 
blowing exhaust across the cocoa, which is drying on a patio, and that too can contaminate the cocoa with this combustion aroma. And that is, again, almost impossible to get rid of. Don't buy it. Um, the last one is, is, is also very serious and probably more common, and one you have to look out for perhaps more in, in El Salvador, is if the cocoa stays on the farm too long and is not stored well, and so there's not a lot of ventilation, the cocoa can develop a mildew or moldy aroma. The beans themselves may not be moldy, but the, they, they pick up what we call a basement aroma, all right? And that too is very distinctive and something that you don't want. So all of these things can be detected just by smelling the cocoa. Don't need a machine, don't need chemical analysis to do that. We, you know, we're given a nose and a tongue to smell and taste, okay? The next thing we're gonna look at is size, all right? Size is really important for two reasons. Number one, for the roast. So um, we're going to set our roast largely or to a certain extent by the size of the beans. Big beans take longer to roast because it takes longer for the heat to penetrate into the beans. Small beans roast more quickly. Um, we can work with small beans, we can work with big beans. The worst thing though is when we have a mix of small and big beans, all right? So then when you're looking at them, you see a lot of small ones and a lot of big ones. And they're really difficult to roast. And the reason is, is we have to set the roast kind of for the middle. And so we're gonna under roast the big beans and over roast the small beans. So it's very difficult to get a good roast when you have a, a, a lot of size distribution in the sample. The other thing is yield, all right? Um, small beans have more shell. You can calculate this, I won't do it now, but just basic geometry tells us that the surface area of small beans is greater than the surface area of big beans related to their volume. And so when we roast those beans and go to winnow them, we're gonna get more shell in the small beans and less shell in the big beans, all right? And also, small beans are also more difficult to separate the shell from the nib. And we're gonna look at that, we're gonna do all that later today. So, but if you're making chocolate and you're, you're gonna do it as a business and even for the home, you wanna get the most the most yield, the highest yield of nibs from your beans as possible. All right, so too small of beans, stay away from them. And how do we assess or how do we look at the size of the beans? It's very simple. We, we, we do what we call bean count. Now bean count is simply, we weigh 100 grams and count the number of beans. And from that, we can calculate the size of the bean. Now you can weigh 100 grams, you can weigh 200 grams, 300 grams, but 100 grams is usually sufficient. So what I have here, I have a basic kitchen scale. It's accurate to one decimal point, all right? So I can measure 99.9 .9 grams of cocoa beans, all right? And it costs less than $20. Very, very, very simple, just go to, um, Best Buy or, or Bed Bath & Beyond, any of those stores or whatever the equivalent is in El Salvador, and buy a basic kitchen scale. And then we're gonna weigh 100 grams, all right? All right, so. All right, so there's 100 grams. Okay, now I'm not gonna make you watch me count these because I've already counted 100 grams, and I found that there's 59 beans and 100 grams. Now these are the Brazilian beans, the Bahian beans. And if I make a calculation, what I can see, if I divide 100 divided by 59, that tells me that these beans weigh 1.7 grams on average. Those are big beans. They're gonna take a little longer to roast, but I'm gonna get a good yield from them. Now I've already, also, I've already counted these Venezuelan beans and they're 95 beans in 100 grams, all right? And so if I take 100 divided by 95, I get one gram, 1.05 grams. And that's really the average size of a cocoa bean around the world. 
Some places are known for bigger beans. Some places are known for smaller beans. But in average, that's, that's about the right size, okay? And so these, I would say, would be normal. These are big. Now, the other thing, if, I, if I'm looking at the, the, the size of the beans, I also am going to show you the difference between this. So on my right are the Venezuelan beans, and on my left are the Brazilian beans. Now, I don't know if you can see the difference in size in this video, but it's quite dramatic. The other thing is that these Venezuelan beans have a lot of small beans and a lot of big beans, all right? And so those are gonna be difficult to roast. I'm not going to reject them based on, just based on that, because it's very high quality genetics, this Trinitaria from Venezuela, but that's gonna tell me right off the bat that they're gonna be difficult to roast, all right? I'm gonna to have to watch it very carefully that I don't burn the small beans while I'm cooking the big beans. Okay, and so we've got size. The other thing that you can look for is moisture, all right? Now, moisture, I don't have a moisture meter. Um, those, those hygrometers are used in the field and you may have access to one. In my workshop here, I don't, I don't use it because I can tell, believe it or not, if I squeeze these beans, all right, and just squeeze them, they just start to crack. And what that tells me is that that moisture is below 8% and more than likely it's below 7.5%. If I feel those beans and they feel spongy, that generally means they're above 8%. Now, you don't wanna buy beans which are spongy and feel kind of moist or damp. You know, they have this spongy feel. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, they're not dried properly, all right? And that may mean, and that may be indicative that there's some internal flavor things going on that, 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 that you don't want. But also, they're gonna roast differently, all right? And so we're gonna see that because we're gonna do some roasting and it's, and what we're gonna, well, what you can tell is that if I've got beans which are 7.5% moisture, in my oven, I'm gonna roast for approximately 40 minutes to get the roast I need. And we're gonna go through that. If those beans are wet over 8%, it may take me an hour and 20 minutes to roast those beans, all right? And so that's one of the, the major factors why you want to really be conscious of the moisture in your cacao. Now the last thing we're gonna do, all right, is we're gonna do a cut test, all right? And those of you who were present and watched uh, our presentation on fermentation, you remember that the cut test is used to evaluate two things. The first is defects, and the second is the degree of fermentation. Now defects are probably the most important. And I'm not saying fermentation is not important, but the two types of defects are infested, all right? The beans have actually been bored into by an insect. And the other is moldy. And so that means that the internal inside the bean has gotten moldy. And both of those can contribute really serious defects, off flavors to the chocolate. Now, if you're going to export beans to Europe or to the United States, we'll talk about the United States because that's where I am, the FDA will check the lot of beans to see what the defect level is. And so they'll cut 300 beans, that's the standard. And They'll count the number of moldy beans, those which have visible mold on the inside of the cotyledon when you cut the bean. And I'll cut one right now just to show you. Um, all right, so they'll, they'll cut this and they'll look, and that's not the best cut, but they'll look at the inside of that and they'll look for um, either green, it's usually green or white mold, all right? And the other thing they'll look for is the presence of insects. Now, the, the primary insect is the cocoa moth, and that leaves a cocoon inside, so there's some webbing, and you can also see the feces of the insect as well. And for the United States, you can have, legally, 3% moldy or 3% infested. Above that, it's rejectable. Or the combined 
cannot be greater than 4%. So you can have 2% moldy, 2% infested, that's still okay. To be honest with you, I wouldn't buy that cocoa, all right? And what's also interesting is those two defects usually occur in the warehouse. Cocoa fresh from the farm is rarely moldy inside. You may see mold on the outside, which is another problem, but not nearly as serious. But you will almost never see mold on the inside. The cocoa is too fresh. This mold develops during storage. And the same with infestation with insects. All right, so those are defects. The other thing we need to talk about is fermentation. And so if you remember from our course on fermentation, the cut test is used to evaluate the degree of fermentation. And the way you do that is you look at the interior of the bean like this. All right, that's not the best color, but you can see that's the inside of those beans. And what we're looking for is for beans which are purple, partly purple, and beans which are gray or slaty. All right, slaty beans have not been fermented at all, and that's a serious defect. All right, so slaty beans, gray beans, um, they fall into a defect category. And in fact, in Europe, for grade one beans, you can only have, I think, 5% slaty, and grade two, 8% slaty. And above that, it's rejectable, it's not usable. Um, so we don't want slaty beans, we don't want gray beans, but the purple beans, that gets a little iffy because, um, again, this purple color is what happens during fermentation is that when the bean dies in the aerobic phase of fermentation, these pigment cells break down and let loose a pink color, pink pigment into the cotyledon of the bean. All right. And that cotyledon, that pink color, is then as fermentation progresses, and even when drying progresses, that pink or purple color is, is converted to a colorless compound by an enzyme called glycosidase. And as that purple color disappears, it shows that the fermentation is progressing. And if, for example, you have 95% of the beans would have no purple color, which are brown, then that shows that, you know, that cocoa was really well fermented. The fermentation process was complete. All right. Now, you would think, oh, wow, that's the cocoa I want. But that's not the case because different chocolate makers want different amounts of fermentation based on what they need to make their chocolate. For example, um, cocoa from Ecuador, Nacional, which is a fine flavored cocoa, uh, is generally lightly fermented to bring out this floral herbal flavor. And so that fine Nacional cocoa may have 50 or 60% of fermented beans and 40 or 30, 30 to 40% of purple beans. And that's fine, all right? So really the number of purple beans is really just an indication that that cocoa is fermented where you want it. It's not really, it doesn't mean that, it, that one is good and one is bad. Now, again, um, another thing though is that it can be an indication that the beans were dried too fast because a lot of that purple color change occurs during drying. And a lot of the brown color development occurs during drying as well. So if you do see a sample which has a lot of purple beans, that could mean that the drying process was, went too fast, is exactly the way. And that can cause some problems. You can get some flavor defects from drying too fast. However, really when it comes to purple beans, it's, it's really the choice of the chocolate maker. Now, what I look for, and it's just me, is I generally look for a maximum of 15% purple beans, all right? So I wanna see a maximum of 15% purple beans in a cut test. And, you know, 15 purple beans means 85% um, brown beans. Now, I don't want 100% brown. Why? Because when, every, when I have 100% brown, I can't tell if it's over-fermented. Now, I may be able to tell by the taste, but, all right, but by looking at it, I really can't tell if it's over fermented or not 
from the cut test. So I always like to have a few of those purple beans in there, which kind of tells me that they didn't go too far. So let's, let's look at how we cut beans. And there's different ways. Um, the way, the, the primary way that I cut them, I use a knife. Now there are guillotines that you can buy, machines that, you, not machines, but it's a mechanical apparatus, which will cut 50 beans at a time. Trouble is that costs 1,200, 1,300 euros, all right? It comes from Switzerland and that costs more than my entire chocolate making equipment, all right? So I'll forget about the guillotine and, and actually I don't like it because I like, to, I like to actually feel the beans in my hand. It doesn't take that long. It takes me about 15 minutes to cut 100 beans at the most, all right? Now I'm not gonna make you watch me cut 100 beans. But this is the knife I use, and this is a special knife that's used by the Cocoa Exchange, the Cocoa Merchants Association, and this is the classic bean cutting knife. And notice that I use the small blade. There's a big blade and a small blade, but I use the small blade because I have more control. All right, it's serrated, and that's important because that makes a good cut. Now, I got this knife in Peru, and this is the standard knife that they use in Peru. Notice that it's a lot bigger and that there's no serrations. Now, they use this, and if you're good, you know, there's no problem with using something like this. However, I don't feel like I have good control. I'm always worried about cutting my hand with this, all right? And so I, I, I tend not to use this. I, I will use it, but I'm always thinking it's gonna go too far and I'm gonna cut myself. So. Put that away. Now, another thing which is interesting, and this is what they use at Hershey, which is my alma mater. I used to work for Hershey. And this is really cool too. I mean, this is easy, all right? It's just a class, these are hedge trimmers or um, pruners, pruning shears, all right? And all you do, you put the bean in there and you just cut it down and you can kind of control how far you go as well. And then you just open it up and look at it. So that's what I do. So typically I'm gonna cut I usually cut the sample that I weighed for, for counting the beans. It usually gets me, you know, between 50 and 100 beans. And that's usually enough for me to make an assessment on the quality of the beans. All right. If you're going to do it, like, officially, you have to cut 300 beans. Now, that's, that takes a little bit of time. So I don't worry about that. So I'm going to cut these. All right. And I'm going to cut them all. And I'm going to lay them out like this. And when I'm done... I'm gonna go back over and, you know, and I can kind of tell as I'm cutting them if they're well fermented because the beans have feel. Um, and what they, they should feel, they should, you know, you know, be easy to cut, okay? And when you open them up, there should be a lot of fissuring, all right? And that fissuring is this. It kind of looks like a walnut, if you can see that, I'm sorry, all right? so you have this fissuring. So it, it has like an inner surface of like a walnut. And that's characteristic of a well-fermented bean. It can be, you know, an over-fermented bean can have that as well. But an over-fermented bean will usually be almost black, all right? So you're looking for brown beans. If you see a lot of like black beans, that's of concern. So you might, <laughs> well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna taste them as well. And that's the final test is to taste them. And we're gonna do that by roasting, which we'll do later. So I'm gonna cut all of these and then I'm gonna count the number of purple beans, the number of infested beans, the number of moldy beans, and I'm gonna make a tally. And I'm gonna use that tally to get a final, let's say fermentation index for this lot of beans. All right, now, as I say, unless I see something really bad, like a lot of moldy beans, some infested beans, or a lot of really black beans or slaty beans, all right? But if for the most part, I'm just getting purple and brown, all right? Then I won't stop there. If I find defects, I'll stop. I don't want the beans. But if, I, if, if it's just purple and brown, I'll do a flavor test, all right? Which means I'll go through the roasting process and I'll winnow them and I'll grind them up into a liquor or even a chocolate and I'll taste the chocolate and that will tell me if the beans are the beans that I want to buy.